Welcome everyone to a special Take 30 News exclusive. I'm Parker King. Uh, joining me today is uh, Dr. Sky Cooley. Uh, Professor Sky Cooley is with the Department of Communications here at Mississippi State. Um, he teaches uh, public relations as well as political communications. Sky, how are you? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for now, having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Now, the whole reason we're here is to talk about um, your article you posted in the Huffington Post, uh, Come Hell or High Water, Louisiana's Flood and the New Normal. And it's uh, regarding, uh, for those that don't know, it's regarding the the negligence that the media had for the Louisiana flood, it took, how long would you say before the media actually started paying some national attention to it? Well, first of all, thank, for, thank you for having me. I appreciate the time. Uh, I would say probably about three days before the national media really picked up on it. And that's actually the second piece that I had done. The first piece that I did for the Huffington Post was really sort of calling out the national media saying, uh, people aren't paying attention to this. I had gotten uh, the opportunity to write for um, the Huffington Post for an Olympic piece, and it was really just to cover I'd worked in Saatchi in the past, um, the past Olympics, the Winter Olympics, and so they had asked me if um, I'd be willing to cover the Summer Games, so I was writing a piece for it, and that's really what the space was intended for. Um, as the flood started to happen, um, three days went by, and the first day of it, I asked the people in the Huffington Post, is it possible for me to write an article about this within this space? No one's talking about it. It's not being covered. I know people in the area that are being affected. And I got no response from them. And so I sat on it for a day. And then when the third day rolled around, I just went ahead and, and published the piece. And, and that's how that, that started for me, which has been an interesting sort of whirlwind to get to be that voice. But I would say national news coverage, it took at least four days to really get a national response in, in what is a devastating flood. Absolutely. And there was a a little bit of passion in that article because this is kind mm -hmm. of a personal matter for you because you're actually from Louisiana, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. So the, the town that got hit the hardest is Denham Springs, Louisiana. It's right there on the Amant River. Um, that's where I'm from. I went to Denham Springs High School. Go Yellow Jackets. Um, supposed to have a good football team this year. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was my home. It was people that I knew. And the only place that I saw any coverage of it were on Facebook p uh, feeds of people literally showing their houses underwater, riding around in boats, which on roads because they were so flooded. And um, yeah, it was something that hit home. It was something that, that frustrated me. I saw my brother, uh, he wanted to get down immediately to, to help do relief effort. He lives in Chicago, my mm -hmm. youngest brother. And so he flew down immediately. I had friends from DC coming in and I was just looking for a way that I could contribute as well. So yeah, that was one of the ways that I could express my frustration and also try to drive some attention to the event. And when you were down there, I mean, um, you, you said in your article that um, there was media coverage, but not to the extent to fully have viewers understand the gravity of the situation. So when you were down there, try to give us a little bit of a mental picture about what you saw. Yeah, sure. Well, one of the reasons why there wasn't news media coverage to begin with is that the media has to serve this entertainment function, right? You need advertising mm -hmm. revenue, and that, that money has to come in. And so events have to be packaged in certain ways, in certain narrative frames, and disasters of people who are you know, out there trying to help themselves and help one another doesn't get that same kind of coverage as, you know, riots and looting and things like that. And so that's one of the reasons why there wasn't news coverage to begin with. And that's one of the reasons why the article got so much salience, I feel like, is because there was a lot of people that felt underrepresented. When the news coverage did come, they did exactly what you would expect. It was sort of packaged in very political ways and mm -hmm. very much politicized. Um, but all that to be said, um, the devastation is extreme. There are entire, I think the stat, and we were talking about it before we came on, mm -hmm. about 100,000 homes out of like 150,000 took in water damage. And water damage is not like hurricane damage. It's not like wind damage where there's some structural things that you have to fix and some glass is broken. Uh, it's not like tornado damage where, you know, certain parts of a town are destroyed, but everyone that's not affected can help. Water damage and flood damage affects everybody mm -hmm. and everybody's got damage and so you have to cut out walls you have to, and if you don't do it immediately they become mold spores and the houses become unlivable right and so you had people that had to evacuate and weren't able to come back to their homes for for days and those homes are basically unlivable now and especially even if they had some kind of uh, insurance regarding flood damage I mean they're only going to receive pennies on the dollar for damaged furniture and um, stuff like appliances and things yeah, like that. Yeah, that's right. So um, if you were in a flood zone and you were, or if you weren't in a flood zone and were fortunate enough to, to purchase flood insurance, you are going to get some money back, but you're still going to take in a pretty big heavy hit. I had a friend that I was talking with and she was telling me that her couches, it cost them $2,000 to have it. They, they're four years old now. 
and the insurance company appraised them for $600. That's what she's going to get back. And mm -hmm. if you go through every item in your house that way, it's a sizable chunk of money that you're losing. And keep in mind, everything is damaged. Um, for people without flood insurance, it, I don't know. It's just going to be a long process of rebuilding. There's going to be a new sense of what it is to, to be a normal lifestyle. You're going to have construction in your home, and you're going to have to piece by piece learn how to do it mm -hmm. or find contractors that can do it very cheaply, and you're going to have to segment rooms and do them one by one over the course of however many years and hope that nothing like this happens again. The federal government's talking about giving ten to $30,000 for people without flood insurance. $10,000 for all the assets you have in your home. Can you imagine trying to rebuild with that? I honestly can't. And to, I, I wrote down a quote from uh, your article. Uh, you said, regarding the devastation and the damage, you said, while, while the devastation is hard to conceptualize, the frustration is not. And mm. then you went on to talk about how there's such a lack of communication between mainly the working class Americans, your, your middle class people, and the, the government. They're, Re their regional, their state, and yeah. uh, even federal political figures. Yeah, I, I think that, well, anyone that's watched any of the, the national Olympic coverage, uh, well, Olympic coverage, coverage, any of the national news coverage about the election, which does feel like the Olympics, it's quite the entertainment spectacle, <laughs> um, but you can see that there's a palpable frustration. You can look at some of the candidates that have been run, sort of the rise of Donald Trump, you can look at Bernie Sanders, and, and those candidates manifest with them. Part of the appeal is that there's a general sense that governments is not responsive to people that can't help themselves. Right. And there's this feeling that there's a growing disconnect between those doing the government, or doing the governance and those being governed. And legitimacy is conferred by conversation, right? Like you have to be able to speak with your leaders. That's how you decide whether they are legitimate enough to rule you. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have that, uh, people become very, very frustrated and they don't feel like they've got a connection with their leaders. And I think that the, the national news media has to do a better job of facilitating that. The media in general need to do a better job of facilitating those kinds of conversations. Because if not, you get a lot of people, when affected by disaster, not only are, are, are worried about their day-to-day -day lives and how they're going to, to move on, but they're also questioning the very government structures that are supposed to protect them, right? And that could help them. Um, and they start to question those things and it becomes very frustrating. Absolutely, and um, regarding how candidates, especially for president right now, politicize this event. I mean, you've got, uh, I know um, a couple of news sources, CNN called this political football. Mm. Uh, Donald Trump came the 19th, Obama came the 22nd, and people criticized him because the week before he was in Martha's Vineyard, and Hillary Clinton says she doesn't even want to go until mm. her campaign will no longer be in effect or will affect like her ratings in the voting f until, she, until she finishes uh, the presidential race. And, uh, sure. So an example of that, so you've got people that are devastated by flood. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's what you've got. You've got entire communities, three or four towns really, that are completely underwater. People have spent days cutting sheetrock out of there. I was there last weekend and people are still literally in their homes, in their, their boots, trying to use a skill saw, cut stuff down, pull stuff out. Huge trash piles outside of their homes. That's their reality. That's the life that they've got to live. The federal government's talking about giving them ten, maybe thirty thousand dollars, depending on how many assets you've got. And they're doing that. They're going through that process. And on television, you see Donald Trump, who goes to a predominantly white area, and goes out and distributes aid, right, all for the cameras. Uh, and then you see President Obama come in. He goes into Zachary, Louisiana, which is predominantly African American area, to go out and distribute aid and make a speech. And it's just the politicizing of it, and in ways that are they're just disingenuous to the types of conversations that we should be having, which is about helping one another and working together to find common solutions rather than trying to wedge things in, in a partisan lens on every single solitary issue. Right, because I mean, you could say that if anything positive can come out of this event, it's that it has brought communities together. Uh, you, I know we've got a picture that um, you sent, if we could get that up there real quick. Um, that, like you were saying, mounds of trash. Yeah, yeah, mounds. And like streets just look like that. Yeah, the entire town looks that way. And you said how, uh, how it's common for someone to know how to cut sheetrock now <laughs> yeah. about four feet and how someone with a table saw is, is extremely popular in the area. But Yeah, well, let me tell you this. Louisiana has had practice with this, right? Mm -hmm. now, we've had 10 years and we've had four really devastating storms, all right? And so when you, when you have that happen to you, what happens is 
there becomes less, uh, there's this acknowledgement that you can't just rely on yourself, right? Like that you're not just this autonomous unit that exists out in space, that you really do need to have friends uh, that have skills that you don't have. Mm -hmm. A truck and a skill saw become pretty handy after a decade of going through four massive storms where you had Absolutely. to do home revision. And so it does make for a different kind of community for sure. I mean, they're proud people. Uh, they are resilient. Um, they, they're, they're self-reliant in the sense that they're reliant on their community to solve problems. They don't necessarily want to turn to the government and, and, and ask for help, but that doesn't mean that because they're not asking, the government shouldn't go in and be responsive to the needs that they know that, that, that exist. I agree. I, I, completely, I, I just got one more question for you uh, yeah, regarding sure. the entire situation as a whole, um, but mainly focusing on the negligence of the media and politicians. If there's one thing that the people from Louisiana, as well as the entire nation as a whole, can take away from this, what what do you think it could be in regards to politicians and media? I think that as I, I think the frustration in Louisiana is representative of a larger wave of frustration that we have as a population with the way our government works. And it's not government's fault, it's not the politicians' fault, it's not the news media's fault. They have bills that they have to pay, right? And politicians have to do things that attract eyeballs that get votes. But if there's one thing to take away from this, it's to take away that we as a citizenry deserve a more accountable media. We deserve conversations that are, that, that are built around bringing communities together and helping people help themselves and helping people help one another rather than simply trying to politicize and separate in order to gain advertising revenue or to create a spectacle so that we can bring in dollars or votes. Mm -hmm. What we need to have are conversations on how to solve problems. And if there's one takeaway from this, the news media has to become more responsive. Their, their role should be as the fourth branch of government. That's, that should be the role for the media. And there needs to be a better job of serving that role. And it's not, again, it has to happen. The citizens have to demand it. We have to be more accountable for that and hold media more accountable towards those ends. And that is keeping government in line and making sure those discussions are able to take place that confer legitimacy. That's the lesson here. And whether this is something that will spark it or if it's the next event or a series of events, I don't know. But I do know that I'm happy to be the person out there trying to be that voice to, to bring those conversations to bear. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely fantastic. We'd like to thank uh, Professor thank Scott Cooley so from the uh, Communications Department of Mississippi State for joining us. And uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen out there, for joining us here at Take 30 News. And uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. Have a fantastic evening.